A reading from Lamentations chapter 3, beginning at the 22nd verse. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for one to bear the yoke in youth, to sit alone in silence when the Lord has imposed it, to put one's mouth to the dust, there may yet be hope. <clears throat> to give one's cheek to the smiter and be filled with insults, for the Lord will not reject forever. Although he causes grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love, for he does not willingly afflict or grieve anyone. The word of the Lord. Be we will read Psalm 30 responsibly. <clears throat> I will exalt you, O Lord, because you have lifted me up and have not let my enemies triumph over me. You brought me up, O Lord, from the dead. You restored my life as I was going down to the grave. God's wrath is short. God's favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping spends the night, but joy comes in the morning. You, Lord, with your favor, made me as strong as the mountains. Then you hid your face, and I was filled with fear. What profit is there in my blood if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you or declare your faithfulness? You have turned my wailing into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy. A reading from Second Corinthians, the eighth chapter, beginning at the seventh verse. Now as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in utmost eagerness, and in our love for you, so we want you to excel also in this generous undertaking. I do not say this as a command, but I am testing the genuineness of your love against the earnestness of others. For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. And in this matter, I am giving my advice. <clears throat> it is appropriate for you who began last year not only to do something, but even to desire to do something. Now finish doing it, so that your eagerness may be matched by completing it according to your means. For if the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. I do not mean that there should be relief for others and pressure on you, but it is a question of a fair balance between your present abundance and their need, so that their abundance may be for your need, in order that there may be a fair balance. As it is written, the one who had much did not have too much, and the one who had little did not have too little. The word of the Lord. Gospel according to St. Mark, the fifth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was beside by the sea. 
Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came and when he saw him fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, my little daughter is at the point of death, come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So Jesus went with him. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. But now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you? How can you say, Who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. And while he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. And he put them all outside. And took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this they were overcome with amazement. Jesus strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. You may be seated. Let us pray. Oh, holy God, let your spirit touch us and stir our hearts. Open our ears, heal our brokenness, direct our ways that we might be a community that is a place of healing place of prayer, a place that reflects you. 
Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of each heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. A verse from Acts 2.42. Maybe you've heard this before somewhere. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and, and the prayers. We've reflected over the last couple weeks about being community for the world, about breaking bread together and getting to know those we don't readily get to know in modern day neighborhoods. This morning I invite you to reflect with me on prayer and the community of prayer. But first a story, it may not surprise you that I played basketball in high school. <laughs> or I should say I tried to play basketball. Until my senior year, which was way back in another century, I never made the varsity till that time when there was a new coach for the varsity who took a particular liking to me, in part for obvious reasons, my height, but also I suspect because I was a preacher's kid. Now, preacher's kid in basketball, there's nothing inherently connected there. Um, but he was a devout Baptist, a devout Southern Baptist, and you knew it. In almost every dimension of his life and his coaching, he wasn't shy about sharing his way of life. So guess who often got asked amongst the roster to give the pregame prayers in the locker room. But little did he know that that was one of the places that created some of my questioning and wrestling with prayer about the ways and the whys. You know, we're getting ready to go out and play a game. Greg, will you lead us in prayer? Do you pray that God take our side? <laughs> and that we win? Which I suspect he might have liked if that was a prayer. And I probably caved in on that at times. Or do you pray to engender God's favor? Just by praying, God will pay attention? And if we wouldn't pray, God wouldn't pay attention? Or do you pray, God, just don't let any of us have injury? Or do you pray that the referees, oh, oh never mind, forget that <laughs> one. The question, was prayer a means to an end? A la a victory. Or was there more to prayer than just about the result at the end of the fourth quarter on the scoreboard? This time through this vast gold mine of Acts chapter 2, 42, I've been drawn to this piece of the early Pentecost community gathered by the Spirit in a community devoted to prayer. The challenge and the gift of prayer. I want to reflect with me about prayer in our church life. What is the ends? of our prayer life. Much earlier in my life, I recall prior to bedtime, 
receiving that parental message. Maybe some of you did as well. Your mom or dad saying, be sure to remember your prayers before you fall asleep. Anybody else with me in that camp? A couple of you? Okay. My child's mind often wondered, not just about the doing of prayer, so is prayer to appease and appeal to God's ego? To stroke God's ego that God might be kind to me? It was prayer to make God into kind of a make-a-wish benefactor for my agenda? Like, dear God, please humble my big sister. Or was prayer all about eloquence and the right kind of wordsmithing and passion and energy? And God responds more to those eloquent ones than those not so eloquent. Or is prayer the way one manipulates God? You pray, you get what you want. You don't pray, and you don't get what you want. Lots of questions surrounded me as a child, and, and I suspect continue to surround you as well. Is this a means to an end? Or what is the end, and what does it look like to be a community immersed in prayer? On a slightly different note, during my years as a pastor, I, I often have fears when it's time to start a meeting, and everybody knows there ought to be a prayer but nobody wants to do it, you know? And someone says, we really ought to open it with prayer, and the leader says, who will pray? <laughs> and everybody's head goes down, you know? Because if they can't make eye contact, surely they, what? They won't ask you to do it, right? So sometimes I think in, in the meeting rooms we need to provide a, neck braces, you know, so there would be, there would be no uh, uh, injuries there from whiplash. Because who of us hasn't thought at times, I'm all for prayer, but don't ask me. I, I don't know the right words. Or I'm not eloquent enough. In our adult Sunday morning class over the last uh, several weeks. We've been, we've been taking a fresh look at Luther's small catechism. And, and last week and again today, and some in the, um, in the part on the Lord's Prayer, there's this wonderful reference, I need to go read this document, about Luther writing a letter about prayer I should make this a test. Who do you think Luther might write a letter about prayer to? The Pope? Try again. Pardon me? Paul? Good try. Try again. To his barber. It's one of Luther's published essays, a letter to his barber. Now, with all due respect for any barbers or hairstylists in the group, don't take that personally. <laughs> but amongst Luther's gems was this. God longs to be in conversation with us. God wants to be our God. God wants to hear a sharing of our struggles and for us to know in that process 
that God is listening and that God cares about us and his whole creation. God longs to be in conversation with us, eloquent or not. For God surely knows that our world is filled with little g gods that have limitations, less wise agendas. God knows that what we often want to pray for are really idols that care less about the consequences of all our wants for me, myself, and I or your equivalent of basketball victories or scoring statistics. In the early community after Pentecost Day, reflected in the book of Acts, I've struck like never before in this one verse that devotion to prayer and being community are in the same breath. For the practice of prayer opens us through community to see what we can't see or hear ourselves. It opens us to each other that we might experience the spirit blowing with grace and healing seeing what we can't see on our own, being the healing that we can't be a vessel of in isolation. But we also know the threat of being in community with that person that makes us grouchy, or not wanting to risk sharing that we can't see a way forward. But Christian community centered in Christ isn't for those who've got life all figured out. It isn't for those who are perfect. But it's a place and a way of being that calls us out of our persistence about the way it's always been or the narrow way we see based on our limited experience that calls us instead to trust in this God doing a new thing. This morning, great timing, we will welcome two new members. Perhaps not the profile you might imagine or your ancestors would imagine when you pray for God to grow Huddle Lutheran Church. How many in today's changing world live lives that don't mirror our own? But yet the other brings unique gifts to broaden and deepen the breadth of our prayers the depth and breadth of our life as community and maybe look like others in our neighborhoods that don't look or act like we think they should. I find, found it wonderful timing our gospel story with this life of being community in prayer for the stories about two outsiders Children and women had very little status in the first century world. They were seen as not deserving of attention. They were nobodies. And even Jesus says in the midst of that story we heard this morning, shh, don't tell anybody about these two. They're marginal. They're not given much value. And Jesus heals, heals those like you and I 
who insist on saying, well, this is the way it's always been, or this is who we're about. Or in Jesus' time, they're getting what they deserve. They aren't of importance to us. But remember what Jesus does? He receives them. He welcomes them. He heals them. And he brings forth the healing of what it means to be a gospel community. He breaks the tradition of the way it's always been and extends community to those of whom the status quo views as, yeah, maybe not so important. So he invites us, this Jesus, to a devotion to prayer and community, inviting us to see the unexpected, to live in this healing and inclusive mystery of grace and mercy, shaped by the one who was crucified by those who wanted it the way they wanted it, because he was a threat. But God raised him from death and raises us to a new way of being community. In my past, welcoming new members often meant welcoming them to become exactly like us, to become status quo. Oh, and let's put you on a committee. Let's give you a time and talent card. Let's sign you up for this, that, and the other. Yet guess what you get this morning? One for whom life originated in Cambodia. A life that is wound through refugee camps, through resettlement, through different religious experiences along the way to this place. One for whom we can learn much for being church in a changing world. We welcome another, a younger adult, new in the area, uprooted from the Midwest in what had been known and familiar, single with his own unique experience and needs in life. And then there's us. Jesus calling us into a game. The game of prayer and practice of becoming a new community. Welcoming the stranger. Not into our comfortable world, but into our place and community where we seek to glorify God and to be servants of mercy and justice and seek to be companions for living into the healing of God's good news. In closing, basketball games and church lives, and what do we pray for? We're called this morning again to trust that God will bring us into life in ways we might never have imagined. That God wants to hear from you and me. That God makes a promise to hear and listen as we pray. Not to win our personal games of power and victory, but to receive Christ's healing and to be Christ's healing community. For all. Amen. Peace of God which goes beyond our parameters. Keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus now and always. Amen. Amen.